All right. It's 4.02, so let's start this, so Michael. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Manny Tejeda. I'm a sales and support specialist at PhotoCare. Uh, welcome to the second part of our video series for the week. Uh, today, we're joined by the awesome Michael Bobenko from Fujifilm. He'll be uh, joining us and teaching us about you know, Atomos, uh, how it works with mirrorless cameras, the proper workflow for it, and uh, some questions I had for him over the week. Uh, you know, some things considering like hybrid log gamma and uh, how to work with a ProOS file. So myself, uh, I've used Atomos products for about six, seven years now. Uh, I came from the event space. I love uh, shooting long interviews and long ceremonies. Couldn't do that with a DSLR or mirrorless camera until an Atomos product came along, such as Ninja 2. <laughs> uh, shooting long events uh, was kind of difficult before that. We had 12 minute time limits and splicing those together in, in Premiere or Final Cut after that took much longer than expected. Uh, I personally did not enjoy that part of the process. Once the Ninja 2 came out, experimented with that, the files somehow looked better thanks to the ProRes codec. Uh, they also um, had better fidelity. Uh, they were easier on my computer to work with since they were not, you know, uh, decompressing an H2.64 file, which was not meant for editing. Uh, I've sold them to customers over the past few years. They've been very happy with them. Uh, they add, did add one bit of piece of, you know, of complication to their workflow because you know, battery management and all that, but I figured that out and explained people how to do that. But I was, I was super happy with that. And lately they've created you know, a new workflow for people in terms of uh, high dynamic range. Uh, people just, th just think if you work in a Rec 709 workflow, that's all, but that's only half the story. If you work in hybrid log gamma or even 422 log, it's giving you so much more dynamic range to work with and edit, I can't work without that anymore. With that being said, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Michael Babenko from Fujifilm and he'll tell us how to work with it in a mirrorless camera. Michael, you're up. Hey Manny, uh, that was short and sweet. Thanks very much. Um, I've been using Atomos stuff for years and years and years. And I primarily, when I first got into it, was exactly like you said, events. Um, in particular, I do, uh, do a lot of music events. So I used to shoot a lot, a lot of bands, live performances of bands. And, you know, concerts are two, two and a half hours long. And so, the, yeah, having an Atomos was an absolute game changer. Um, got my lineup of things that I own, actually. So this is a Ninja Flame. And I have an Inferno. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. And then this is going to show you how far back I go. This is what you mentioned. Here's a Ninja 2. That's right. Ninja 2. Not a Ninja Blade, a Ninja 2. Classic. We still have a classic, classic in the store. <laughs> classic. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, it's another way, way, way of saying old, but that's all right. So I'm a classic. I've been with Fujifilm 29 years, so that makes me very classic. Um, so uh, I find them really simple. You can see behind me here, I've got an X-T4 with an MKX lens on it and a Ninja V sitting right up on top of it. And it's just a great, wonderful, handy thing to have. You know, when we, um, you know, I've been in Hollywood uh, for a long time. I'm out in LA and I've been in the movie business on, you know, in, in very different aspects. And, you know, the external recorders are pretty much a de facto piece of equipment, not necessarily always for recording, but also for monitoring as well. Um, it's just, especially with mirrorless cameras, it, they're, they're a godsend because the cameras are small, the screens are small, you want something bigger. Um, you definitely do get the advantages of the choice of codecs to record in, you know, like we, uh, you know, for a, for cost reasons, but also just because of processor limitations, you know, we're limited to what our internal code uh, recording is just like anybody else is, you know, in the mirrorless DSLR market as well. You know, there's only so much horsepower you can pack into a small camera like that. Right. So, um, the interesting thing about it is now 
these small cameras were never really designed. They weren't designed to overtake real professional cine level uh, acquisition devices, right? Um, and nobody's necessarily advocating that they should either. They just don't necessarily have the form factor. But I can tell you from personal experience, like when we made our XT3 demo movie, uh, which is now going back oh, not quite two years ago. Uh, you guys want to see something really cool. Uh, go to YouTube and Google the title A Different Beyond. That's what it's called. A Different Beyond. It's a nine minute movie shot all on X-T3s um, with uh, Atomos recorders. And the cinematographer director on that was a, a good friend of mine, Maddie Labatique, ASC. So Maddie is a huge, huge, big time DP. He did both Iron Man's, uh, he's he done Straight Outta Compton. He did The Last Star Is Born. He's just an incredible, this is a big time guy. And he basically did a nine minute Marvel movie on XT3s with uh, Atomos recorders. And if you go to the BTS, there is a making of, it's about 10 minutes long. You'll see all the shots. You'll see uh, the shots of the Atomos is mounted on the cameras and in rigs. Uh, we had them on cranes. We had all kinds of things. So um, it's an FYI, I added the BTS video into the chat. Oh, no, what? <laughs> I, I love you, Manny. Thank you. Uh, you're so on the ball. Um, so um, that is what I like about, you know, having the choice of, of Codex. Now, I myself have been a Final Cut user for, we're going back about 15 years, um, whatever it is, from Final Cut 2. I forget when that was. That's how far I'm back I go back. That's my editor of choice. I do also use uh, Premiere now, uh, but I still happen to like Final Cut, just I'm comfortable with it. Even the Final Cut 10, I think it's fantastic. But because I've been in the Apple ecosystem for so long, ProRes has just been the natural thing for me. So DNX out there is a great, great codec to have, uh, but it is basically you know, for people that are on Avid systems. Um, I, and this is just, I just know from personal experience from most of the sets that I've been on TV and film, uh, when they're recording either uh, as, a, as a, what they call a mezzanine codec, if they're, if they're not recording camera raw, they are almost always recording ProRes these days. Uh, so uh, I've just got uh, total confidence in the, the ability to use ProRes. Um, in terms of camera setup, it's really not all that complicated. HDMI out to the recorder. And our cameras, uh, our cameras allow you then to record internally to the SD card, uh, or you can go externally only. And you can also record simultaneous backup. So you could record 4K uh, internally and 4K externally at the same time, uh, or you could have 4K going out HD going in as an editing proxy, the setting up the workflow is entirely up to you. It's very simple. So again, part of what we're talking about internal processing power. One of the things with uh, our cameras is the internal record, even though it's in 10 bit, so you have 10 bits of color depth, the color subsampling is limited to 420. Now, having said that, before everybody, you know, you run for cover, screaming, going, ah, that's terrible. 420 is actually completely, completely adequate for, you know, I would say, honestly, 90% uh, of use cases. Um, but 422 is much, much better for color, and it's much, much better if you're going to start doing color grading. So 420 is perfectly malleable within certain limits, but when you start pushing things up and down with exposure, you can end up with banding. So the 10 bit helps a lot more than the eight bit, but having 420 for critical color, uh, in particular with green screen and blue screen, I, it's highly recommended you go to 422. Boom, that's what the Atomos uh, comes to your rescue for that. So, um, I am going to go to my screen share and just show a couple of things here. So this is, um, this is just some files. This is in uh, Final Cut. So what I'm going to do is talk about a couple of uh, setup options of the camera. So what you're seeing right now is what is known as the information overlay on the camera. OK, 
okay? So if I hit play, this is live video, you're seeing the, the audio go up and down. Well, you definitely do not want this on your Atomos file, okay? So uh, it's very, very important. This is something that some people will get caught up with by accident. So the way to fix that is you need to go into your menu and there is a display item called HDMI output info. See that? All right. So I'm going to scrub through this instead of just playing. So HDMI output info display, you want to be able to turn it off. So I have it turned on right now in order to show you that. Okay. But you want to go into the menu and turn that off. Otherwise, all that stuff is going to be recorded on the file. Can't get rid of it. You're screwed. Okay, so turn HDMI info display, turn that off. Uh, but something you should turn on is the HDMI rec control, okay? So what this is, this is a very, very handy thing, is that when you are going to record to the Atomos and the SD card, by having this turned on, when I hit the shutter button on the camera, okay, it will automatically kick the record the Atomos on. So there's an HDMI flag that goes sent that gets sent out over the cable and the Atomos will start recording automatically. And then when I hit the shutter button again, the Atomos will turn off. So um, now you don't have to turn this on uh, because you could simply go to the touch screen on the Ninja and hit the record button on the touch screen and roll the ninja that way, all right? However, what if you're in a panic or you're a one person crew or something like that and you forget to do that? You hit the record button, so it's gonna to record to the internal SD card, but now you've forgotten to roll the Atomos. So having this turned on uh, protects you, saves you from not, um, not recording on the Atomos by accident, okay? So turn that on. Um, so then we have choice of recording types of containers and codecs. So um, with our cameras, like I said, you could say record Rec 709 proxy internal in the film simulation. You could record the film simulations externally. So my favorite is the Eterna film sim. It just is very movie-like. Or you could go to F-Log. Now, if you look at this point in the screen, okay, you notice at the very, very bottom, HLG is grayed out, okay? So I have my choice of film simulations and F-log, F okay? And I can decide where I want them, what my destination is, but I cannot go to HLG. The reason for that is because HLG requires to have the H265 compression codec enabled on the camera, all right? Now, that doesn't mean you're getting H265 over the HDMI, okay? The HDMI output on this when you're doing F-log or, or H-log is always uncompressed 10-bit. So you're getting clean, uncompressed 10-bit over the HDMI. But in order for us to actually process uh, the uh, uh, HLG, hybrid log gamma, is you have to have H.265 turned on. So the way you do that is you go into the file format and you have your three choices. This is off the FT, XT4, so you may not see these on the T3, but on the T4, you now have an MP4 option. So you enable H.265 and this will let you get to hybrid log gamma. Okay, so excuse me, I need a quick sip here. Some lovely green tea, I'll lubricate my throat. Um, Let's talk a little bit now about um, 709 hybrid log gamma and F log, all right? So these are uh, some simple files recorded out here in my backyard. And as you can see, they look really, really different, okay? So this one is Rec 709 in the eternal color space. Oops, sorry about that. Rec 709, the eternal color space. This one is hybrid log gamma. And this one is F-log. So just between, let's just look at 709 and, and hybrid log. So, and I, by the way, I'm going to back up. I use the Eterna because that is the, um, I want to say the most honest of the film simulations in terms of uh, color reproduction, saturation, and contrast. 
this is the closest you can get really to what your eye is actually seeing because the astia, the provia, all those other ones, they're much punchier, they're much crunchier. They give you a lot less latitude for any kind of color correction or grading whatsoever. The Eterna is actually still quite gradable, but it is in Rec. 709, okay? So HLG is Rec. 2020 and F-Log is Rec. 2020. So it's a bigger color space, but they're completely different encodings, okay? So it's the math that the camera is using to distribute the values between black and white, all the tonal scales are putting it on a completely different curve. So you end up with much more tonal range. Now, you can look all this stuff up, up on the internet, but um, let's go to F log. So F log, log stands for logarithmic, right? And all the different camera vendors have their own flavor of log. Ours is F log, it's Fujifilm log. There's S log, there's Canon log, there's log C from ARRI, there's red log, there's different logs. Every camera's got its own and you have to go by the manufacturer's setup for exposure and stuff like that. Um, hybrid log gamma, however, is a, a universal thing that's shared among everything. And it was developed primarily for going straight from camera to broadcast straight to high dynamic range TV broadcast. So HLG is of primary interest for uh, sports and uh, uh, what do you call it? Concerts, live events that are going directly to uh, TV. So the name hybrid log gamma is it's sort of a mashup between Rec. 709 and F log. So if you look at this, if you look at the uh, shadows and the midtones on the HLG, it's not that different from the Eterna, all right? It's definitely flatter, it's definitely less saturated, but it's not miles away. But look at the top end, look at the highlights. The highlights are completely, completely different. Now go over to the F-log, compare F-log to hybrid log gamma. So the top end is still a little softer, but notice the huge dramatic difference in the bottom end, all right? So F-log gives you a lot more dynamic range in the bottom end of the tonal scale compared to hybrid log gamma. So for that reason, Hollywood movie business, okay, and, broad, and uh, the TV episodics, basically they stay away from HLG. They do everything in log. So the reason for that is they've got more room. They want maximum control over everything. So with pure log, you've got more room on the bottom and the top. But for ordinary people like you and me, I actually suggest using hybrid log gamma. It's really, really good because you don't have to, the picture, first of all, if you're dealing with a, a client, like say you're, uh, you're doing a shot A with it, it could be a wedding, but say it's a corporate customer. So you're doing an infomercial or something like that, right? You show this on the set to somebody that doesn't understand what they're looking at and they're horrified. They think they're gonna fire you because they think you don't know what you're doing as a cinematographer. You show them this and they go, oh wow, that's very movie-like, okay? Um, so there is less for you to worry about grading wise on the lower end of the scale, but yet you've got a lot more on the top end. And that's because the way HLG is built, it's kind of like a regular tone scale with an additional tone scale on top of it, okay? That's simplifying it, but in a nutshell, that's the way to explain it. Um, so I'm going to turn on my scopes and I'm gonna turn on, oops, yes, my color wheels here. Um, so if you just look at the scopes and I'm doing this in a Rec. 709 workflow because none of us, well, maybe some of you watching, you may have HDR monitors. I don't have an HDR monitor. Um, I personally uh, have not needed to deliver any HDR product, even internally in our company. Uh, so I'm not seeing HDR when I'm, when I'm editing or color correcting, and chances are I'm willing to bet at least 95% of you out there aren't either. You have to have an HDR monitor to see HDR signal properly, okay? So we're going to work in a Rec. 709 workflow, but I'm going to show you that uh, HLG is still very, very helpful. So this is just a normal exposure. And if you look at the scopes in the Rec. 709, you can see I'm out past 100 
And um, on HLG, most of my signal is down under pure white. And then with F log, you can see the difference. So look at the bottom end on the scopes. You can see how the shadow values change, right? Big difference in the shadow values. Um, but what's nice is I can go in here. So if I go to this clip, which is the 709, and I'm just going to go to the brightness in here. And if I go to say minus 0.3, so I can bring the brightness down. If I go to my HLG file, and I'm going to go to the same thing, just go to the brightness minus 0.3. So all I did between the two is I applied the same amount of brightness. Um, I still have more shadow values to play with in my high hybrid log gamma. But if you can see, I corrected what's going on in that far back wall uh, quite a good deal. So I'm going to magnify this. And if we go back here to that back wall, if I go between these clips, I'm able to keep a lot more highlight detail. And if you look at those leaves back there as well, so it's not just that it's getting darker. No, it's not just that I'm bringing the levels down. There is more actual detail back there in those leaves and in that wall. And that's just with a simple brightness correction. And I'm able to do that. I'm not able to save that uh, with the Rec. 709 without trying to introduce some nasty banding and some nasty artifacts. All right, so this is where I really, really like HLG. So I'm gonna to go to these three files. Let me pop out back here. Hey, Michael. Do yes, you sir. feel that this is a good workflow for people who work with high contrast areas, like shooting at noon to save your bucks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In particular, for those of you that are doing weddings, think wedding. Yeah, white dresses. Think white wedding <laughs> dress on a beach, ah, okay. So, uh, but even, you know, the wedding cake or something like that, anywhere that you need to control. So anything outside of 709, if, now look, I'm going to back up, back up. 709 is perfectly wonderful and great, especially with something like Eterna. You know, if you get your exposure correct and what you see is what you get, there is nothing wrong. You don't need to do log, okay? Uh, but being able to go to ProRes 422, even in 709, is still much, much better, especially, let's say, uh, if you're doing fashion stuff or you're doing a music video where there's a lot of action, a lot of things changing, you know, um, uh, having something like a ProRes codec, which is less, less prone to artifacting, is still a better way to go, even if you don't need to be doing a lot of color correction. If you've controlled your lights and uh, you've got the, the white balance dialed in and everything like that, 709, even on 422 and ProRes, is still uh, going to give you a much, much better result. But uh, in terms of protecting your shadow values or your highlight values, log is definitely very, very helpful. So if you look at these three files, I'm going to look. So I exposed here, obviously, for the foreground, which is in the shadow. So it's midtones, OK? Um, but you can see my shadows are already a bit clipped. You can see they've gone down below zero, so the black patch. So um, I'm able to bring that up. You can see with F log, it's a little bit higher, but they're still down there, okay? And that's because, you know, I was trying to, I wanted to expose for the midtone. So look in the back upper left where the telephone pole is against the sky. And you can see already here that the sky is really taken on, and I don't know the monitor you're looking at, the sky has taken on a very, very saturated, extremely cyan look um, because it's already starting to push the edge of the color envelope of the Rec. 709 color space. And also look at how uh, kind of crunchy green the foliage has gotten back there as well. And yet if I go to the HLG, okay, it's really pretty and delicate, all right? There's a lot more information there. Um, so this is, and if I actually look in here, so I've actually, uh, actually, I forgot to notice that I had actually set the brightness. So I'm gonna reset that. Um, let's go back in here. I'm gonna reset the brightness on that one. Sorry, this was the actual native capture, all right? This was the capture as it was. So you can see that the shadow values are preserved. Uh, I've forgotten I turned that down. I apologize for that. But in going into bringing back things back, 
if I decide I want to say go to minus point, oops, sorry, reset that. I want it to go to minus say 0.4, right? And go here to that. And just in my brightness, go to minus 0.4. Um, what's going on back here is it's not quite so nice. So this is the HLG. This is with the 709. You see it's still, the color has really been pushed. And I can see there's the beginning of banding between the edge of the telephone pole and where the sky is whereas it's preserved nicely in the HLG. Um, so uh, that's kind of my, my two cents on workflow is that um, I think HLG is a, lo a lot easier. It's a lot more friendly, especially when you're dealing with clients you know, that might be on the set. They're looking at your monitor, looking at the back of the camera. It just simply doesn't freak them out. And yet you've got a boatload of highlight data out there to be able to, uh, to work with. So, um, awesome. Manny, what do you think? Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> uh, that was a pretty good thorough breakdown. Um, in terms of workflow for, instead of memory cards to hard drives, hmm. what are your thoughts on that <laughs> with an Atomos recorder? Uh, well, you know, SSDs, you know, SSDs are cheap now. Um, and, um, I have found that I would definitely go to Atabos's uh, website and look at their recommended SSDs. Uh, they haven't tested every single card out there on the market, but they've tested a lot of them. And I have found that, um, through, uh, uh through different uh, kinds of, uh, like through AJA and through black magic, there is, um, I forget what they call it. There are these softwares that let you check the actual read write speed of your disc. Yeah. yeah. I found some SSD cards that I thought were good, you know, that I got maybe two years ago and suddenly you find that they're not so good. And when you go to record something, especially if you're recording like a 60 P or something like that, uh, they don't meet the threshold for the data rate. And so uh, I would definitely go with the re uh, recommended cards. Now with SSD cards, I'm sorry, with SD cards, you know, you've got, uh, for us, we recommend using the uh, UHS-2 cards, which uh, even for stills, they're the ones that have the double row of contacts on them, right? Mm -hmm. So no, that'll work with more, Yeah, they're a bit more expensive whatever, about another 30 bucks. But this, these are fast. These are fast, 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 okay? The other spec to look at is going to be uh, on the front, you know, there's a V number. So for video recording, uh, the V number does, does matter. So it's not the class, but the V number. Um, so the V60, they're again, they're a bit more expensive, but if you are doing 60P recording internally on the T3 or the T4, uh, we say you need to have the V60 card. Uh, anything else from that, the V30 is fine. Um, are you but, able to get a full 60P, 4K 60P signal into the Ninja 5 with the X-T4? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so here's the important thing. Another important thing is what is, there's so many links in the chain here. You got to have for 60p, you have to have HDMI 2.0. So the recorder has got that. The recorder is capable of it, and the camera will put that out. Yeah. But you've got to have an HDMI 2.0 cable. It has Specifically to be 2.0 cable. <laughs> I'm not kidding. All right. Most of them are 1.4, 1.4b or something. And that will give you 4K. It'll only go up to 4K 30. So you can do 4K with, uh, uh, you know, pretty much almost any HDMI cable out there. But if you want 60P, you've got to have 2.0 or you will not carry the signal. Awesome. That's a great answer. Um, one question that I usually get is uh, battery management. Uh, you're running two batteries off of the camera. So one off the camera and one for the Atomos. Uh, my personal solution, I never use the battery in the camera. <laughs> I tend to only want one battery to manage everything because it just makes my day a little easier. Um, V-mount batteries are great. Uh, I personally use a Core SWX, uh, mm -hmm. this under the battery, and that's plugged into an MPF adapter. So that's one battery and that'll hold me down for about 
six hours? What are, what's your solution? Um, I don't have it on here. I, I, you know, if it, if it is out in the field for a long time, I use V-mounts as well. And so I'll put uh, an, an adapter plate on here that has P-taps. So I'll run a P-tap to the, the Ninja, and then I'll run a P-tap adapter for, to the battery adapter. So the T4, there's no P-tap adapter yet on the market, mm -hmm. but for the X-T3s, they're, they're out there. They're made by a couple of different companies. Um, so that replaces the battery, and there's a cable that hangs out of it, a little pigtail. Uh, you can go USB-C with power banks as opposed to um, the, uh, the V-mount type batteries. Some of the V-mount batteries have a USB plug on them. Some of them only have a P-tap, but some of them have a USB yeah. port. So you could do that, but you got to go into the USB-C. Um, but I have found usually sometimes though with us is you can always just attach the battery grip to the bottom of the camera. And that way you've got three Fujifilm batteries, uh, which is good for a long time for you know, at least an hour, an hour and a half worth without having to swap. But yeah, pro level users are pretty much always using uh, either V-mount or Anton Bauer type batteries. Uh, they're big, they're heavy, but yeah, they run like for a day, you know, without having mm -hmm. to, to worry about it. Um, I know on the Maddie Labatik movie, you know, that we talked about is they guys, so in the movie business, they will like never turn off the camera. Even when they're on coffee break, or they're moving sets around, the camera sits there, they just leave it on. And the reason for that is they do not want to worry about, oh, did this go off? Did that go off? Or that They just want to grab it, be able to you know, frame it up and start recording. So um, they will only uh, swap batteries with as rarely as possible. Um, but um, what was I talking about battery mount? Oh, that is one of the nice things though, say on the, say the, in, 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 uh, what do you call it? The Infernos mm -hmm. is there's two battery slots on here. Okay, so you could put two batteries in here, whereas the Ninja V is one, but there's also the AC power adapter. You can put on an AC power adapter in place of the battery. Uh, you can run it off of, uh, you know, external power that way as well. So like if you're doing every, a concert or a wedding or something like that, you know, you could just run it off AC power since you're going to have house power available usually. Perfect. Uh, audio, <laughs> always a fun thing to do with an Atomos recorder. Uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, when some people, someone opens the Atomos recorder, plugs a source into it, and they record long takes, go into Premiere or Final Cut, and they see multiple audio tracks. Um, the easiest way to do it is to turn off. If you click in the, the monitor, you're going to see a, a row of channels here. Make sure you turn off the, the first one, because <laughs> that's actually the analog in on the side. And if you don't have anything plugged in, it's going to be blank <laughs> and it's going to drive you nuts and you're trying to sync audio. You'll have to delete everything. Uh, make sure you have the record button set on the second row of audio channels and your monitor is also set for that. If you have multiple uh, sources of audio, then you're going to have to turn that on and uh, go in from the side. What do you think, Michael, on that top? top no, I, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's the way I leave mine. So, and I always just, I just basically plug, you know, uh, again, you know, when you're, when you're a, a pro cine, you know, pr uh, broadcast TV, you're doing second sound anyway. But I just plug the mic directly into the camera and then that way it follows the video signal into the Atomos, you know, I've had never any problems. The only problems you get maybe a bad cable or something like that, but yeah, I've got no problem with doing it that way. Uh, the next subject, ooh, we got actually a, a Fujifilm hardware question from Rory Edge. Ready for this one? Um, uh. <laughs> he's using a Fujinon MK uh, 18 to 55 lens micro four thirds mount. Yeah, with, it uh, exists. Yeah. He's using it with a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. Uh, he may change cameras to another Panasonic camera, um, L mount. Uh, does Fuji have plans for an adapter that would make possible to use the lens with a Fuji camera? Or does Fuji willing to do a lens swap conversion? Uh, let's see. That's kind of a long question. So let me try to break it down. Is there an L mount? Is that what you're saying? Is there an L mount coming on that? Yes. Or no, he um, already owns the lens. Right. He, he owns the lens. But, but I, I have absolutely no idea if there's an L mount coming or not. I'm not really familiar with the L mount spec. 
-hmm. So uh, the question comes down to flange depth. Okay, so um, if, uh, again, I don't know, not a Panasonic guy, yeah. I, I haven't picked up an S1 or an S1H, so I don't know about the L mount spec. If the L mount spec is a little bit fatter, it's not so much better, then you would have to come up with an adapter to go from M4 thirds to L mount. So the lenses are built to work with a particular uh, flange mount. So the MKs, not the MKXs, this is the MKX, which was, which is built for our X series cameras. The MKs were designed around Sony E mount cameras. All right. Then by way that that's is adaptable to M4 thirds because the M4 thirds is only a little bit uh, fatter. So it's almost exactly the same. And it's just by way of changing the rear flange. I just, I can't speak to the L mount because I have no idea about the L mount. Are we going to make another one? So I, again, I have no idea. I'm not aware of that at this time. So because they were designed around a shallow flange depth. So yeah, he's saying that a, a MFT services in the UK, they make an L-mount conversion. He'd rather do it through Fujifilm, but I don't think they offer that service at the moment. We don't, oh, we don't offer the conversion, no. No, there's plenty of, plenty of third, there's a third party uh, conversion companies and you know, uh, cinema rental houses and stuff like that uh, that offer solutions like that, so. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thanks for the awesome question, Rory. Does anyone else have anything that I could uh, answer in the Q&A? Uh, what SSDs do you use in your uh, in Ninja Five right now? You use uh, the Atom X drives, Glyph. Um, I have to say I have not gone with Atom X yet. Uh, this I believe this is Samsung. This is a Samsung EVO. Samsung EVO. Yeah, okay. I think I've got two EVOs and uh, I've got a QVO or something. I've got I've I've got a mix of stuff. But I like I said honestly. I've gone back and found some of the ones, some of their like Corsairs and PNYs and stuff that I got a few years ago. Do not cut the mustard anymore. I get the little um, little warning thing. Um, yeah. Ever <laughs> seen a little kangaroo? Kang thing? Little kangaroo? <laughs> yeah, which I found out uh, some of our good friend Roger, that's the kangaroo has a name. It's called Skippy. Yeah. <laughs> so when Skippy shows up on your screen, it means you're dropping frames. So that's not- Very Australian name. product. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alexi is asking, other than recording, is there anything you lose out by going Shinobi versus Ninja V? Um, just recording. They, they, met, they parity matched with via firmware updates um, besides recording. They're the same product except the same screen. Mm -hmm. Just uh, they have the chipset, fans, and the hard drive bay. Yeah. <laughs> For, and right now, Atomos is actually running a lockdown special. I would definitely take advantage of it. The was a Ninja V is Ninja Five is usually that was six forty nine, and currently it's four ninety nine. <laughs> That's pretty insane. And the XT four just went on sale yesterday. Yes, it did. That's <laughs> right. So get your XT four now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, any any other questions for the Q and A, please? Uh, oh. Ooh, Seth has a really good one. High speed recording, 120p or 240p, not possible in Atomos, correct? Yeah. No, it's, uh, for us, it's internal only. Yeah. The, it's internal the, HDMI, the HDMI bus just doesn't carry it. So. Yeah. And well, HD and HD, what's tops? Is it uh, 120 or 240? On the T4, it's 240. Yeah. But everything else HDMI. pops out at, at 120. Okay. So, what would be your workaround? shooting 60p and then over crank and post if i need 240 i got no problem doing it internally yeah. i mean i know it's you know i've done it and it looks fantastic so i you know but uh and i would say this with Atomos products always keep your firmware up to date <laughs> they keep uh, releasing new features mm -hmm. um uh, like recently they're going to be you know they had uh aspect ratios uh the the system is actually changing the, the interface itself is actually more legible now for you know beginners. <laughs> so everyone keep those up to date. We should be at what 3.4 now, is it? <laughs> she just confirmed that. Mm. Uh, oh, 10.31 actually. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, 10.5 is supposed to drop in June, which will be nice. <laughs> yeah. And likewise, camera firmwares as well. 
So, you know, I think most of you are Fuji film owners know that we're famous for releasing firmware updates to fix things. Yes. So I remember I had an experience, I think it was the X-T2. Uh, there was an, a hidden firmware update that fixed all, all my HDMI issues. <laughs> no one mentioned it, but I, know, I noticed performance was better. Uh, Horatio, uh, which Atomos records dual SDI 444? So that would be a Shogun 7. That would be a, yeah, right? Or the, the, the Sumo maybe? Um, the Shogun Inferno? <laughs> uh, Any of the seven inch monitors that have SDI should oh, be. Oh, the Shogun, to... yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the Ninjas, the Shoguns, yeah. Yeah. Oh, looks like Roger answered that one. <laughs> oh, so his answer was at the moment, none 422 max on all products mm. for dual. Um, what is the best way you have found to protect the setup in bad weather? Pelican cases. And an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've never, I, I've never taken this out. I've never taken these things out into what I would call, you know, mist or rain. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they've got, they're open at the top. They've got yes. airports. So you've got to, you have to find yeah. something to cover it with. Uh, I know the T3, the T4s are actually really well weather sealed. Very, very well weather sealed. I have shot them in the rain and they've been, they've been no problem with that. Um, on the that uh, the XT3 different beyond shoot with Maddie Le Batique. we shot that it was out here um, uh, outside of LA in the month of August where we had a heat spell it was four days of 105 107 degree temperature and that's where we were mm -hmm. we were two days on location outdoors in 105 degree heat and we never had the cameras or the recorders shut down at all so I can tell you for heat not a problem uh, weather though, uh, you're just going to have to protect it with a, a raincoat or something, you know? Nice. You're in, in, in LA right now. Are you seeing a lot more productions using Atomos products? I don't want to say a lot more because they're basically on all of them. Yeah, so, all of them. so standard <laughs> now. <laughs> I, I, I honestly have to say it's the most, it's the most common one out there. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, looks like we've answered all the Q and A questions. Um, I think we're all ready to wrap up. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you have any support related questions, please support at photocare.com. We'll, we're always happy to answer your questions. Uh, any sales related questions, sales at photocare.com. Uh, Michael Roger from Atomos is actually answering questions in the Q and A. Fantastic as always. <laughs> Uh, Michael, you're, you, that was a great uh, you know, introduction to Atomos products. Thank you for helping us today. My pleasure. Hopefully we have something new for you. Tomorrow we have uh, a night photography uh, session with Anthony Festa uh, on Capture One. Please make sure to join us. It'll be in the events page at photocare.com. If you haven't signed up, please sign up as soon as you can. Things tend to fill up. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye.